And we're back! This time we are coming to you from the beautiful Mount Union, Pennsylvania, childhood home of Sherry Quinley. We actually served as the youth pastors in, <laughs> boy, that was a long time ago, long time youth ago. <laughs> pastors in this church as our uh, second ministry <laughs> appointment. Our first one was children's uh, pastors, and then we were uh, youth pastors here before we left America and have lived in the nations ever since. So it's been a really cool journey, and it's always a little sentimental to get back here to Mount Union. And uh, so thanks to New Life Fellowship yes, uh, and to Pastor Denise Percival for allowing us to make this church our home again mm -hmm. and set up base here. All right. Well, it's great to have you back. And we've got people from all over the world. I see Cy and Deneo. And, you know, if you'd make comments, we can see exactly yes. who you are. So log in, say something to us. Yes, Cy's coming from Aberdeen, Scotland, and Deneo is in Pretoria, South Africa. Been there, been there, love it. Um, and we've got our amazing dream team in Thailand that have joined in with us. Raina, Vi, Mark, and Uno, and Tatum, and Joanne, and Ray. Um, and then we've got Ross. And and, sorry? And Joe. And it's, Joe. Sorry, it's Joe. It's so hard. Once we start, <laughs> you just can't stop. Cannot forget our amazing Joe. Um and we've got Lourdes in the Philippines. Um, I have not been looking in the last few minutes. So, Chuck, you see anybody else that has joined in with us? Uh, it's hard because I have to look way down there to see the <laughs> monitor. You're but, here because you're supposed to be here. The Lord gave you the time today and the alert and pointed you this way. You're supposed to hear what we're going to share later, and you're supposed to get to know each other. And so this is all part of God's big plan for you. We've been asking you a question, and here's the question was uh, for discussion. What do you think is keeping you from finding your life's purpose? Because today the theme is purpose. <clears throat> finding your life's purpose and living it out. What you get? I'm going to read a few of these um, from Ross. Uh, Ross and Kyunga are in Korea, in Seoul, Korea right now. Hi, Ross. Uh, Ross says, indecisiveness. How much does that hit most of us? I received many talents from God, which he really does have some amazing talents. So the inevitable question, what will you do when you grow up, was never easily answered. When I was younger, I thought if I told God I wanted to live the plan he has for my life, that meant he would provide opportunities and the path would be easy to follow. I didn't do much and waited around for God to show me what to do instead of choosing. Ultimately, my dad reminded me that the disciples were at work when they were called by Jesus. Good wisdom, dad. Rather than waiting and doing nothing, work. Do something. Choose a path. It can and maybe will change. But in choosing and actively doing something, you can learn what you want to do or not. You can develop skills and abilities. You may be called to something different, or your calling may be what you choose to do from the beginning. Life's purpose, most often, doesn't come as an epiphany. Um, Ruthie Dahal from Nepal, now living in New York, New York City. City. Uh, Ruthie says, me, myself. <laughs> That's what keeps her from finding her purpose. I'm scared and terrified of not being accepted in the world, and sometimes I even put the world before God, which is quite sad. I've been trying to find my identity in Christ and live for Him. I bet I'll be able to find my life's purpose and live it out once I truly figure out and accept who I am in Christ. And Leia Peralta um, writes, Leia is in the Philippines, she writes, as a young pastor's wife, I'd say, I'm still also young emotionally, that whenever I face criticisms and get hurt by them, I easily cave in and start to question my calling. I'll find myself stuck for a bit, but then I have to remind myself again and again that it's not about me and that it is God who called us into ministry. Jessica de Guzman, a uh, lady a few words here, says distractions, and that's right on the point, distractions. Um, I'll read one more for sake of time. Um, but you can find these in our Media Light page. Yep. And um, there will be another question for next week's um, 
show. If you'll go to that on Sunday or Monday and look for the question, would you please answer these so we can hear from you? Um, Ivan Bautista says, Keep, keeping me from finding my purpose is the busyness of life, being occupied with other things instead of pursuing or finding my life's purpose. One example is my current job because it gives me financial security while trying to find my purpose is full of uncertainty. Okay. Yeah, our jobs will come and go. <clears throat> we'll, we've got so much to say about a lot of these things, uh, but we're going to shift in just a minute to today's talking points, but this is a good opportunity for you to bring your friends on board. Uh, it's really important that we reach out and share with our friends and pull them in. There are a lot of people that you know they need uh, spiritual feeding. They need the right kind of encouragement, especially those of you that are involved in creative fields. Uh, we're, we're always very sensitive to try to be there for you because it's a, it's a new group as far as having uh, a platform because all these years creative people have pretty much just made pretty things for rich people and now they're actually in charge of some of the biggest operations in the world and biggest corporations and they have a voice and God wants you to use that voice and we want to be there for you as you sharpen your communication skills and you sharpen your skills to be God's messengers in Babylon. So, Amen. you know, uh, 2020 is almost over and it's Amazing. been a year of bam, bam, bam. I mean, <laughs> we've been beat up this year. It's crazy. But it's and been good. <laughs> it's been a good year. We made progress, but uh, we always we, say nobody grows in the good times. It's mm -hmm. through the hard times that we grow. So, yeah. uh, we practice what we teach. And so when we saw this year just flying apart, we jumped up and made a plan for it real quick. And that plan has helped us. So uh, we want you to do the same thing. That's why we have this series on resilience and bouncing back in 2021. I'll be back in just a minute with my talking points. See you in the chat room. Mwah. All right. Hey, welcome back to our series called Get Back Up, which is about resilience bouncing back in 2021. This is the season to get ready for next year. It's going to take a while to get yourself uh, organized so you can push forward. Uh, we have eight different sessions in this series. The first two we've already had. Number one said, get your, get your energy from your social circle. You got to get your relationships all maintained. So if you've got bad relationships, strained relationships, <clears throat> halfway working relationships, spend some time with people, apologize, forgive, get that settled. Second thing, last week we said to focus. You're going to have to stop distracting yourself and cut off any activities or habits that keep you bouncing around social media, television, etc. And get your mind and get all your energies, get your money and your time all going in one direction with your people behind you. And now you're off to a good start. But it doesn't matter how fast you run ahead if you're pointed in the wrong direction. So today we're talking about purpose. We need to know our purpose. We need to find our purpose and get completely aligned. Uh, if you can get all the aspects of your life focused and aligned behind your purpose, you're going to have a great year, regardless of what happens during that year. It's going to be a time that's meaningful because you're doing what matters now and you're doing what matters the most because you're, you're working in line with your purpose. Okay, where in the Bible do we go to find out about our purpose? The very first page of the Bible, Genesis 1, 28, God has created humans. We wake up from our creation and he says, all right, I'm going to give you now your creation uh, calling. And he called the animals to do different things, but humans 
are made in the image of God. That makes us unique. We are imagers of God. We are here to reflect the heart and value system and the vision and dream that God has for this world. He created this world for His purpose. And in His purpose, it is paradise. It is a place that where His heart's desires come out, where things are fruitful and grow bigger and, and every, uh, you know, from the plants to the animals to the humans, that everyone is fruitful, you know, that we are, we're all creations and we're all little creators of our own small world, you know, my life, uh, the, the social circles he's given me, and that, you know, this is God's big vision that he's going to live here with us forever. And this is gonna be the place of connection between the heavenly realm and the physical realm, and, and this is the hot spot in between. It's a beautiful vision, and it's all gotten messed up. And so God is on a mission to bring this world back to alignment with his vision for it and to rescue those people uh, who want to be part of this, those who will be loyal to him and those whose hearts will tune to his frequency and learn to love what God loves and hate what God hates. And so he turns to humans and he says, I am making you my co-regent, my co-ruler for my planet. Now take dominion over all of it. You're in my image. And he, he breathed his own breath inside of us. And it's a beautiful, huge purpose. And it's honestly, it's mainly the only purpose you need to know about is to get in line with God's purpose. If you live your life like that, you are already walking in the purpose of God. It's what the will of God means is God's desire, God's want, and he wants people to be in alignment with him so he can bless them and so they can be fruitful and they can multiply and that brings him joy when we develop and we expand and our world grows, it makes him happy. And he wants to see the whole planet doing this. So in the search for purpose, start there. It's most of it because this is where most people already are off track because being self-centered, and that is the big issue with humans, being self-centered, we get it in our mind that there is some story about me, that it's the story of me, 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 my favorite person, me, the awesomeness of me, my own personal legend. And so when we start looking for purpose, we do this, in a lot of ways, really ridiculous uh, practice of bucket lists. Oh, I want to bunch jump, and I want to go do this, and I want to go do that. And it's a lot of this is just pure vanity. It is self-indulgence. You know, I'm just going to, to give me all these awesome experiences. Well, there's a good way to make a bucket list, and there's a, another way that is just what I described. The problem is, this isn't a biblical way to live. Because as far as I can tell, God has no big plan to make me, just me, awesome. It is not really important to him that I end up with a mountain of money and I have all these medals and awards that I've won in my business and I've, I've conquered the business world and I've got a lot of education. Look at, look at me, look at what all I did. Go do that, fine. There's a lot, of, there's a lot to be uh, gained from being ambitious and going forward. Just don't think it's God's job to get you there. And that that's what this whole deal is about, is that I know what I want, I've got my dreams, and I want God to be the rocket fuel that pushes me out and the protection against anything bad happening to me. And you'd be surprised how many people, even Christians, have exactly that in their mind. They are so mad at God when they don't get their 
uh, their raise at work and their promotion falls through and things don't happen the way they want it to happen because they really think the story is about them. When I read my Bible from Genesis to Revelation, this is what I get. There is one story. It's God's story. It's his story. That's why it's history. And he is building a story. It, is, it has a stage, and yes, there's a spotlight, but there's, it's a tiny spotlight. It's very tight. There's only room for one person in this spotlight. It's for the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's for Jesus. There's only room on this stage for one hero, and it's him. Now, the, that, maybe that's real disappointing, but that's the big plan. That's the story of the Bible is the perfect human Jesus has come from God, is God, and is bringing God back his will on earth. He is fulfilling the purpose of God. And he is bringing home children, sons and daughters to the Lord. And he's going to fix this planet. And that's the story. Now, the amazing thing, the shocking, really amazing thing, is that in the Jesus story, God's story of salvation, the one story, there is a role for me and for you. We have a function and a purpose in God's will, in God's own story. He made a place for us to participate in this story. It's like there's this one huge tapestry as big as the starry heavens above us, and it's the story, the great story of the love of God and of the sacrifice of God for humans. And we've got that story, and then, whoa, what is that? What are you weaving there? It's me, huh? I get to be in the tapestry. I get to be in the story. It's not the story of me. It's not the story of the, you know, the awesomeness of me. It's his big story. But he's gonna let me have a role in this story. Now, the, the the Bible story I'd like to go to is the story of David. Let me draw a quick line. So we get from creation, Genesis chapter 1, and humans are told their purpose. Be fruitful, multiply, take dominion, be my image. And then things don't go so well, and so God chooses one human from the area near Babylon, and his name was Abram, and he says, I'm changing your name to Abraham, and within my story, this is gonna be your role. You're going to raise a family. That's all I want you to think about. So leave your father and mother, because it's not a, you're not just a part of your dad's family. You're a new thing. You're gonna be the beginning of the family that brings back blessing to all the families in the world. So raise a solid family. Go live among all the pagan people, people that don't know me. Just go live among them. Go out into that desert place, and I'm going to show you some land that's where your family's going to live. And that was all Abraham had to do. It's his purpose. It's his part in God's big story. Now we go on forward a few generations, and the family has gotten so big, and they found that land, and they're living in that land. And now they're so big that they're actually a nation, but they're not a very well-run nation. They're very tribal, they're divided, they don't connect well with each other, they have a lot more loyalty to their clan, I mean, down to blood feuds with other members of their family. And so they're clannish, they're not united, uh, and they're weak. They don't have organization, they don't have a capital city, they don't, it's just a messy, it's a messy circumstance. And so God reaches out in 1 Samuel 16, and he sends the prophet Samuel to uh, a town called Bethlehem. And he goes there, and he says, I want, I want you to go to the family named Jesse. The father is Jesse. 
and I want you to tell him you're there to have a great feast and you want to see all of his sons. And so Samuel does that and, and Jesse has eight sons and he calls seven of these sons to join. And so the prophet gets ready and you know, he, he's looking for which one to anoint to be the king and he sees the first one and he looks at him and he says, ooh, he's tall, he's good looking, this has got to be the man. And as he begins, the Lord interrupts him in verse 7, chapter 16, verse 7. Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at at the heart. So if you're going to ever know your purpose, you know, if you don't want to walk with God and if you just want to live your own life your own way, honestly, I got nothing. I don't know how to help you. I don't know how to give any encouragement or guidance. I don't even know how you find your purpose. I mean, if this world is completely random and there are, there's no spiritual dimension to a human, and if we just made up all this stuff and all we are is animals, and then if some big asteroid is going to come hit us and wipe us out, honestly, I don't know what anybody's purpose is. Just do whatever you want to do. But that isn't the world I believe in. And when I walk with God, it gives me clarity. I know why I'm here. And there's a joy and there's a focus in my own life. There's a health that comes into me. And God is looking for people who are wanting to walk with him. And so here's a good looking guy that society would say, ah, that's the kind of guy I ought to be the king. And the Lord, and Samuel too, he's, he's part of his culture. He goes, ah, and the Lord says, do not judge people by how they look. That is the least thing. He said, I am looking at hearts. And so you have this big dinner and all seven of them come in front of Samuel and he, it's none of them. God just keeps speaking to him, not him, not him, not him. Gets to the end, he turns to the father and he says, do you have any more sons? And the dad says, eh, I got one. He is the least, you know, he's the least in my estimation. He's the youngest. Now, can you imagine the message that he just sent to his son? The leading spiritual figure of their entire nation, a prophet of weight, had come in to their home and said to the father, I am here to bless your household and to have a meal with you. And the dad didn't even bother to call David. He's just out in the fields. It's, I mean, he's reachable because Samuel says, well, go call him. And they call him as soon as he comes in, the Lord says, that one, that one, he's got a purpose for me. Samuel pours oil all over him, says, you're, you are anointed to be the king of Israel, and he hits the road because he knows the, the mad king, Saul, is going to be after his life. So he anoints David, and he runs out, and David's purpose begins to come more clear to him. Uh, so let's talk about how to find your purpose, and we're going to line this up with some of uh, the ideas we get from David in his life, okay? The first thing about your, your purpose is your purpose has to be a form of utility for others. Let's get that right. Your purpose is not for you. Again, it's not the story of you. Your purpose is a function, like, okay, uh, a hammer. What is the purpose of a hammer? What is the purpose of a spatula? What is the purpose of a gas pump? You know, they don't exist for themselves. They have a service to render to other people. And when they, you know, if you try to use a gas pump as a hammer, things are not going to go well. But when, uh, when a thing or a person can find their usefulness, everybody has a reason to need them. That's what makes us valuable, is that we serve a function in the lives of other people.
people. And so now David is having his function revealed to him. This function will find you. You will find yourself just doing this for people. In my wife's case, Sherry is an includer. Uh, she exists to serve the social units that she belongs to, whether it's her family or the church or Medialite or whatever group that she's a part of, she will serve that group loyally and faithfully. And one of her best things is to be an includer because groups can be kind of loosely connected. And she pulls the group in a circle. And it's really, some people are really, oh, I don't want to have to do all this. And why do we have to be together so much? And she knows tight circles are really important. So she's pulling everybody together and she's looking for the one that's kind of not included. Maybe they're brand new or maybe they're just, for whatever reason, they're not in that middle circle. They're fringe people. She's grabbing them. Hey, do you know them? Do you know their kids? Hey, let me introduce you. She is pushing them in. She's watching. You know, did they connect? If they find their connection, she's done well. Now she's on to her next one. And that, that drives her in her heart. She's from a small town, and in her town, it's all connection. You know, you're a, you're a native. That's where we're at today. Uh, we're back in beautiful Mount Union, Pennsylvania, and uh, warm people, and they all know each other. So that's the context she was raised in. And I think that takes us to our second point. Uh, your utility, your usefulness. So you got to figure out what your usefulness is. What do you normally end up doing? You know, for me, uh, I end up explaining things. And it, it can be something complicated. I love to learn. And it can be something really complicated. And I know when I've tried to explain the complicated things, a lot of people like their eyes just glaze over. So I've learned through time because I'm really excited about something I learned and I want to pass it on. I've learned how to make a complex thing pretty simple. And so that's a function. It's good for the group. They learn all kinds of things and they don't have to go to all the effort to learn it. And so I can just teach it to them. So to be a teacher um, is important to me. And all my life, when I was six years old and in school, teacher made me the leader and then other places in life, I always end up being the leader. So I tend to be the leader in whatever thing I'm involved in. It's a natural role for me. I don't fight for it, it just finds me. Uh, but the third thing is, is related to what I'm talking about now. Um, there is typically some kind of wound that takes place in our life. Yes, we get all these gifts and that's part of who we are, but generally, let's say between six and 12 years old, there's some kind of, of wound. It, it hits us and it hits us deeply and it stays there. It leaves a mark we can't get rid of. And this is really not the tragedy that you make it out to be because this is where you get your passion. This wound makes you see the world a little bit differently. And certain things become very important to you. You will weep about them easily and you will get mad about them easily. These things are, I'm sensitive about that. In my case, uh, our family came out of rural, I guess you could call it poverty, except I've asked my dad about this and he says everybody was at the same level, so sort of like everybody was poor, uh, poor. Uh, but he had dreams. He had dreams that yeah, his kids were gonna have the world of opportunity. He was gonna see how far life could take him and he was going to expose his children to the bigger world and any opportunities that they wanted to use their gifts. He wanted to make that available for them. So I'm the eldest son and I was the one raised as he was having to pay the price for a life vision like that. So I missed my dad. He wasn't there a lot because his job took him away from home. Um, he made it after that and he got to be home a lot. But there, you know, there's a price to anything that you aspire to. And so there was a, a missing place in me of having a mentoring relationship. And as I grew older, I knew 
I knew how much I missed that. And I determined, even as a teenager, that all my life I was going to find people who were younger than me, and I was going to coach them. I was going to tell them whatever it is I had learned. I was going to pass it on to them, and I was going to be a mentor. So your, your uh, life calling, this utility that you have, is connected to a pain, your giftedness, but also driven by a pain. Your why, you know, is this thing. And so you need to ponder that and figure out, okay, you know, where is my passion inside? What do I get mad about? Uh, what kind of injustice really bothers me? How am I going to be useful? How am, I going to, how am I going to use that to fuel my service? And now you got to find the third thing out, and that is what group do I feel called to? Uh, what group am I naturally interested in helping? And so for me, as a young leader, uh, going up when I knew I was supposed to be involved in ministry and uh, a life like that, I looked around me and I did not receive mentoring. Uh, people that were designated as, uh, you know, I was in church life, so bishops and other leadership sounding titles, they didn't really spend any time mentoring me. And I was there to be mentored and I wanted it. So I care about people getting their start in life. I can't I can't be there for, you know, for anybody their whole life and try to make them not get hurt, and I wouldn't do that anyway, uh, But because you learn a lot. But I would love to be there their first time at bat because I really do want to help them hit the ball the first time. If they can get a home run the first time they hit it or score a goal, you know, if I can be a part of that and they'll be excited and they'll drive their own growth at that point. But I love to be in those early stages of a person's growth. So figure out your utility, which is connected to a wound that hopefully has gotten healed or it's gonna to be toxic, so you don't want that. So you gotta deal with your wound, but your wound has some magic in it. It's got some beautiful power in it because it's, Jesus is a wounded healer. His wounds are not a horrible tragedy, it's why we are healed. And that woundedness in you gives you the authority to speak about a certain kind of pain. And there are gonna be so many people that will just feel the beacon that you have. You're a healthy person who's conquered in that area and you're gonna have so much power in their lives. So who am I gonna serve? What's my function? And what's my why, you know? Okay, so once we figure those things out, you've just got one more step and that is in a world as disrupted as our world is right now, I think most of us can stop thinking that we can make a 10 and 20 year plan. Even big companies hardly do this because it's, it's just a shot in the dark. You're probably never gonna get to do those things you're planning. But what you can do is say, all right, well, I've got my first three things settled and those last for life. Those really are sort of magnetic north for you. And once you settle on those, typically, you've got a general direction of how to serve for the rest of your days. What you need is the next 12 months. Now, something very clear, something very focused, something big enough that it's gonna take a year to do, but to know where to focus your energies. And if you can find that thing for yourself, in order to help this group in this way, I'm gonna do this for the next 12 months. If you can get a clear enough plan, get your relationships behind you, get your energies focused on it and push ahead, you can do amazing things in the year to come. You know, for, for me, um, I was living my life focused in Asia, uh, living in Asia and found myself in this COVID year. So 2020 has been to uh, get online, start doing a weekly online meeting that can gather the community we already have and gather new friends. And I'm so glad that you're watching, by the way. 
and, uh, and make them all one people. And so that was 2020's focus. And we pulled everybody into the circle around that goal. 2021, we'll keep doing that. But now we want to take some of you deeper because some of you need training that will professional level, good, solid training. We're putting together around 20 courses and a program that will be transformational uh, and can be all done online. And that's what 2021, our focus is going to be there. Uh, early in the year, we're going to talk about it and we're going to keep developing it all year. And it's going to take all our energies pushing that way to make it get off the ground. But we can do that. It's going to take the whole year, but it's going to be great. And by the end of the year, we, we will have run three, about three cycles of new people coming in, going through the program, graduating, and we're going to improve it every time. So I know what my 2021 is all about, and we really want you to focus on the same thing. Spend time this week, get your mind around these concepts, and God's going to show you His will for you as His image in 2021. God's going to use you. Be prepared for it. All right, we're back live and ready to dialogue with you and interact with you about how this touches your life. One of the comments um, when we ask the questions on the Facebook page about your purpose, what um, distracts you from your purpose, um, somebody commented on their job. Um, was I forget who um, commented that. Sorry mm -hmm. about that. Um, but they were saying they feel like their job, although it provides financial support, um, distracted them from what they felt like was finding their purpose. Um, can you make any comments on that? Um, I, th I think there are some jobs that we get into just to earn money that really don't fit us. And, um, but you have to be careful because every job I've ever had, I wanted to quit sometimes. And so you, you have to just wait. When you get in those kind of times, you're just frustrated, sometimes with yourself, or you're not growing enough. And if you wait a while, you get through that, and then you're okay again. But there are some jobs that are, they really don't fit you. So, you know, don't, don't walk in and quit and then go look for a job, because that's usually the worst way to try to find the job that fits. Stay employed because that makes you a winner and then you can get other jobs uh, while you're employed a lot easier than to walk in with no job. Um, but a lot of people don't understand what a mission field their job yeah, is. It's true. You know, it's a great place. It's your place outside of your church circle. It's your place with people that are so unlike you. Mm -hmm. And it's, and a lot of times, you know, some people will, uh, will say, I've had Christian people say, you know, I, I need to quit my job because these people are so wicked and worldly. And I actually had somebody put the next sentence there. I want to work for the church. And I thought, oh, sister, <laughs> <laughs> there's times in the church that you wouldn't believe that it's a church. Um, but even if it always was wonderful, what's the point? I mean, it's more salt in the salt shaker. And if the church could develop some kind of massive employment system and everybody got to work for the church, what would that do to the world? How in the world would we be of any benefit to our community? you got to get out to do that. So um, maybe take a second look at your job. If it just totally is a waste, that's one thing. But if it's just hard or demanding, or the people are, you know, not the kind of people that you would, you might even could trust, you're a missionary, mm -hmm. and, and our whole life, that's, that's why we're here, it's seek and save the lost. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, in the beginning, you made, you reiterated the point that we've made a few times during uh, the last weeks um, that we've been doing our show, is this life is not about me. And mm -hmm. the Lord really spoke that to me years and years and years ago. It's not about me. And we've said this many times. It's about bringing glory to him and finding his lost children. And 
you know, those lost children are in your workplace. So don't ever feel like this is not a place that you can fulfill your purpose. It really is. And mm -hmm. often we're in those places just for that reason, to be light in a dark place. So um, unless, like, unless you're just miserable every day you go to work, you know, look at your job differently. This may be, you may truly just be fulfilling your purpose there. Just don't think your job is your purpose and that every job is a is about, oh, maybe this That's job is my purpose. Your purpose mm -hmm. is bigger than your job. Mm -hmm. Your job, we got a whole course about this in the new school that's coming out. And it's, it, it gives you time to really unpack the idea. Because when some people are looking for the will of God, they really are just looking for a job. Uh, a better job, a job they like more. But the will of God is so much bigger mm -hmm. than that idea. You know, when you get lined up with what God cares about and how God is living and what God's dream is, what God's will and wish is, you've got your purpose. You'll find your purpose. And the thing about that kind of purpose is it, it stays with you for the rest of your life. You'll never have to wonder you know, how to do the will of God will do the thing that God wills, the thing that God cares about, the thing that God loves, and be his partner in that. And you're in the will of God. Now, the secondary question is, what job should I get? Mm -hmm. And that's uh, employment is a whole nother matter. And it, it's an important thing to think about. Mm -hmm. And especially if you're young, you know, you need, you need to think about a career, mm -hmm. not just jobs, mm -hmm. uh, a certain skill set that becomes yours and you can carry these skills and add new skills to them. But you know, the first point I made, if you just keep that in your mind, all of us become valuable to the human society when we serve that society by yeah, bringing something good. unique to it. Mm -hmm. And that's how, that's what purpose means. Mm -hmm. It means you have to be useful to someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that I'm just a legendary figure out conquering hill after hill, that's a fairy tale. You know, that's, that's not a proper motivation for living. And if you'll turn it around the other way and say, I am here to serve. Mm -hmm. And that's how Jesus came. You know, he's the king of kings and he's washing feet. One of the reasons was their feet were dirty. They didn't wash them. Nobody else washed them. It needed to be done. This service needed to be performed. And so mm -hmm. he did it. So we're a kingdom of servants. We're mm -hmm. kings, but we're servants. And if you get that, yeah. you'll go far. Last week you talked about, you know, being in the present. And presently, you know, I think we draw a circle around where we're at and who we're with. And, you know, again, we mentioned before also that we minister within our boundaries. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's important that we make a difference um, in those, you know, in that area that we are in, in our household, in our job place, in our neighborhood, um, in our church community, uh, wherever we're at is, you know, where we can find our purpose and live that purpose and be, again, light in a dark place and remember that, you know, it's not about me. Uh, it's about the others that we're around and the others that we serve. Mm -hmm. um, I want to read a comment here from Priscilla Reyes. She says, figure out your, utili your utility that is connected to your healed wound, repeating um, what Chuck had said. This is a fresh point of view in finding life's purpose. And then Jake Ging Gingrich, he, he, Gingrich. Sorry, Jake. <laughs> he, hey, Jake. Uh, he said, good word today. Our passions do come to us through our pain. And uh, John Sarte also um, picked up on that, if I can find his comment here. Nowhere to focus my energies. Oh, sorry, John, that was on a different one. But he says, nowhere to focus my energies for the next 12 months. Got it. Um, I just want to make a comment about that also is finding, um, you know, finding our purpose in our pain. And um, I'm thinking of my daughter, Jessica, or our daughter, Jessica. Um, you know, she is working on her career um, and starting up. A, she, she struggled in the first um first time having a baby with um, nursing. And a lot of new mothers, young mothers, um, have that experience. I know I did. And um, and that, you know, mattered to her. It was a real passion. And she mm -hmm. pursued um, getting lactation consultant um, 
degree and now is working on developing her, her, her own career path in that regard to help others. And, um, you know, that's just one example of finding your purpose in your pain. Some people, um, you know, have experience sexual abuse and that is a driving passion that moves them towards uh, a purpose in a mission that they feel to help um, raise up awareness and help rescue and, and um, things like that. So we find we do find purpose mm-hmm. in our pain. And some things you know you just do them as they come up like say in that case you're you're a trauma survivor of some kind. You're going to have an authority. When you deal on that subject, people are going to listen to you, and they're going to, especially if you're healed, uh, and they're going to feel the sameness. It doesn't necessarily mean this is what you need to do for a living. Uh, when it's, you may want to volunteer some, mm-hmm. uh, but you might not want to do that every single day of your life. It may just be something though that you 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 keep your ear tuned, and when someone sends out a little help signal. You know you're the one that can turn. You can you can zone in and help them wherever you're at in a restaurant or wherever you find those people. Um, but sometimes, like you mentioned Jessica's case, it actually is a like a perfect path to the kind of employment that you just love to go to work every day because mm-hmm. this is the thing you know mm-hmm. I want. But it all comes down again serving others. Mm-hmm. How can I be useful? Right. To you, what group do I want to be useful to? What's my special way that I serve? And why do I even care about all this? Um, it's important to understand what your strengths are. And if you've never mm-hmm. taken the, the test strength finders, mm-hmm. um, I w- would highly recommend that you do that because it's it's important to work in your strengths um, that God has designed you, yeah, you can specifically take it online. with. Mm-hmm. So you just, what? It's the Gallup Organization Strength Quest or Strength Finder. You just Google, you'll find it. Let me read a comment here from Cy Matthews. Cy Matthews. Hi, Cy. She says, our calling is about God building character in us. It is not about taking over the world and becoming super awesome in the eyes of man, but to be a deep lover of Christ and people. Mm Mm-hmm. Jacob, again, says, every job is an opportunity to learn. Stay in it until you learn it. A door will open to move on. Give yourself fully until the door comes or the door opens. And that's a great word um, from somebody that's experienced life. Um, Mm -hmm. There is great wisdom in listening to those who are older than us, although Jacob is not older than us. (laughs) I think we're about the same age. But, Mm -hmm. you know, as we've walked and journeyed through life, we learn a lot of lessons that... Mm -hmm. Um, it's important to listen to. And that is how jobs, like, never take a handshake for granted. You know, you may be meeting somebody that, uh, in a career sense, that, that isn't above you. They're not a person that owns a door. You don't know who they are, though. You need to always honor every human uh, because you just might find out one day uh, that his brother is, you know, there's connections. Humans are, uh, you know, every day when I, when I have my prayer, I have a, um, I have this little prayer reminder that I've got. It's a, it's a chain. And on one end of it, there's a, there's a bunch of little, mm, little like BBs and they're on a, they're in kind of a net. And I start my prayer with that, and it represents to me my network. All the people that I know in this world, some of them I'm blood kin, some of them are friends, and friends are family you choose. Mm -hmm. And so our friendship network, others are people that I've worked with. Uh, There's groups I belong to formally, informally, groups that I used to be like big in that I, I don't really mix with them anymore very much. Because I've moved on, they've moved on, but they're still friends. And I just have this network and donors and, you know, people that they care and they invest and they stay with us. And this whole network, my own children, my wife, uh, the families that we both come from, your network is your life, you know. Mm -hmm. And I start my prayer just looking at the net and then thanking God for my network. He is Lord of my network. And this network opens 
has opened every door I have ever walked through. It's where everything in your life comes from. Mm -hmm. And you need to cherish it and build it intentionally and build it aggressively and just keep reaching out and add good people. Mm -hmm. Be a collector of amazing people. And that'll help your life more than most things you can do. Look Here's out. a question, um, and I think you may have answered it. Would you recommend changing vocations after many years of success and stability for the sake of chasing purpose? Yep. Uh, I All I can say is for myself, every 10 years, well, it's like this in nature, grow or die. And I watch people do this all the time, and I know why they do it, because I, I have to do it also. You see a guy that spends 25 years becoming an attorney, and he builds this big practice, and the next thing you know, he's quit that, and he's in the inner city, and he's working as the legal, you know, legal smart guy for a nonprofit, and I know exactly why he did that. You know, he... He learned what he could learn. He built the career. He did the thing that was his first goal. And it was good he had that goal because it stretched him. It made him a bigger person than he would have been. And it exposed him. But it also helped him find what is real, what matters. Money's not the thing. And then they start to find these other arenas. And they say, wow, another part of me that is stifled, it gets to grow. And that part seems more important than, you know, to just do another 25 years in this career and become a bigger what I already am. So, yeah, I think about every 10 years, I'm a crazy, dedicated learner, and I have to have a pretty radical overhaul of what I do in terms of my job about every decade. I stick with things, but... Uh, I need to grow. I need to keep exploring new things. And I think there's a, there's a lot to be said for that. That You don't just do it randomly. And don't think if you'll quit your job, you're going to find happiness. Or if you marry somebody, you're going to find happiness. Or if you could just have children, you'd be happy. Or if you could just... Happiness is in here. Mm -hmm. you, you, know, you want a happy marriage? It's two happy people who are married. Mm -hmm. Marriage will make you happier. Uh, it'll give you a lot of things. It'll it'll limit you in some ways, and it'll blow your world wide open in other ways. So it's a, it's wonderful, and I recommend it to everybody. But happiness is something that has to come from the inside. And if you just pursue happiness, you're not going to find it. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the trick in the uh, the pursuit of happiness clause. Is you can chase it all day long, you won't find it. You got to pursue purpose. Mm -hmm. You have to know that you are doing, when you click in, and it all comes from service, when you find your group to serve and you serve them the way you serve best and you're, in, you're healed from your wound, but you use your, your story of pain and you use the lessons learned to fuel your service, okay, now you're in your, you're in your slot and it just feels, feels right. Yes. <laughs> we always tell people when we do marriage counseling, um, marriage was not designed to make us happy. It's designed to make us more like Christ. And mm -hmm. it goes back to denying ourself and serving the other. Mm -hmm. And if we're both doing that, we will be happy. Um, but we learned that lesson. And Cy Matthews wrote, dying to self is hard, but one that is a gateway to miracle, miracles and breakthroughs. And again, it goes back to the thing, this life is not about me. So um, John Sarte posted here. Thank you, John. He posted a link to the Strength Finders. So be sure. I think you have to pay for this one, though, mm -hmm. correct? But it's it isn't bit. much. And for it's worth all doing it. If you haven't ever done it, it's mm -hmm. so worth doing it. When we do our media light, this is one of the intakes that we always do mm -hmm. um, so that our students can discover who they are and work within that their personality, strengths, their the strengths that God has given them. So we would highly recommend you doing mm -hmm. that. And also we're going to put a link here. If you would are interested in getting updates from us, um, we'd love to get your email. So we'll put a link up now to, to receive um, your email from you. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, 2021 is coming. It's just a few weeks away. And this is the 
quarter of the year that you need to give yourself to looking back and looking at the lessons you've learned this year, see where your mistakes were, where you could where you can do better, see what things are holding you back, and especially things up here that are mm. holding you back. Yes. Uh, look at your physical condition. Am I in shape, mm-hmm. better shape now than I was at the beginning of this year? Uh, look at your finances. Mm-hmm. Are my finances in better condition right now than they were at the beginning of this year? Look at your servanthood, your service. Look at your spiritual growth. You know, are you becoming more like Christ through this year? Take a good inventory of this year and then answer the questions that we laid out for you in this episode and get yourself ready for resilience, Mm -hmm. bouncing back after a really tough year on the whole world. Get back up in 2021. Thank you all for your participation, for all the comments and the questions. We really love you all and um, look forward to being with you every week. Well, that's all from us. This mic is yours, so go raise your voice.